on this anymore. So I believe, that, and I, I could be wrong, but it's a 50-50 call. I believe that what we're going through now, even though it's not been done properly or organized or it's a complete farce, but actually the principle of actually leaving the EU, I think the UK are a trailblazer. And I think a lot of other countries will follow. And that's what the EU are scared about. I mean, when you say let's not forget about the raison d'etre, Andy and I have talked about this uh, a long, long time ago, which is the origin of the EU was simply a price-fixing cartel. It was called the European uh, Oil and Gas Corporation. That's what its original name was, actually. Um, And so it was meant to give a bit of stability to farmers. Uh, And this is basically what the EU still is. I mean, of course, you know, they try and and pretend that it's increasingly elected, and and in some areas it is, but it's still the European Commission is largely unelected. It is a price-fixing cartel. Um, Andy, I would appreciate if you could um, refresh. I mean, we talked about this. I heard this story on your podcast months ago uh, about what Thatcher did at the time when she was actually questioning the amount of money that was actually pumped in the EU. And, and, and she realized already at the time that the UK was actually the biggest net well, yeah, contributor. I mean, she was and she was asking, why? Yeah. Do I, we have to have yeah. straight or bent bananas? That's right, because she says, we, she, says we want our, we want our, she says we want our money back. I says, for every pound we were putting in, we were only getting 50% of that back. I said it didn't, you know, it, it didn't she work like that. 30 years yeah, ago. I mean, she, she was. Um, and, um, and now it's happened. I mean, the thing is, it, I think it's, is it a good thing? I think so. I think I will fight. I'll, I'll always fight anything which I believe is going to be um, is going to lead to some form of socialism. You see, the, the big the big shame is that uh, some form of uh, you know smoothing over of economy and trading can only be a good thing. But th- they really should have been advised by people like you and I, with an th- understanding of the mind and psychology. You can't mess with people's identity. You can't mess with the structure, the fabric of their society. They will reject you. I want to ask a practical question in regards to Brexit, okay? You've got thousands and thousands of companies. I used to own my own company. You've got thousands and thousands of companies that are trading and have been trading with the EU for many, many years. Whether that's to get raw product, whether that's to sell a service, whether that's to sell a good, or whatever. Now, Tell me, and I know the answer already, unfortunately, tell me how organized they are in terms of the leadership and the communication they have received from the UK government in terms of what they should or shouldn't be doing. Will they be paying tariffs? Will they not? What documents do they need to fill in? How quickly can they get their goods in? Why are Tesco stockpiling at the moment? Because they don't believe it's going to go very well at all. Uh, I talked about before the export, and they call them their export brokers. There's not enough of them. We need 50,000. I think at the last count, we had seven or eight. So we will not have enough people administering the big, big companies getting goods in and out. So there's going to be queues. There's going to be locker jams. I don't understand why, again, going back to the deadline, you need more time to get this organized. It doesn't mean you're going to negotiate any, uh, not as hard, if you like, but you need to give businesses that are the heartbeat of the country time to get themselves sorted. They are the ones providing and giving taxes to government. Look, he, and they're he, completely all over the place. Look, he, he's, he's, look, he's he's the, the perfect excuse for all of this. Here's the one thing Corona. I can say. No, here's the one thing I can say. We've got an opportunity to become a very healthy country because the thing is, it's a great opportunity for us all to become pescatarians. Because we're going to have a lot more fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we'll have it all to ourselves, won't we? We'll have it all to ourselves. Nice. So, um, <laughs> so there you go. So, um, because when you, when, you, when you actually think about, you know, some of the healthiest countries in the world are like Iceland and some of the Scandinavian right. countries. They, all, because, they live on whale well blubber, they don't they? On, they live on, yeah, they live on uh, a, a pescatarian type diet, don't they? And add to that, add to, the, add to your example, which is a great one. What we've always said, for example, when Thatcher, I think it was 84, they went into war with the Falklands, is 83, 84. The point is that you always need a war to get business going. It's really good for business. So you know what? Let's carry on with the way we're doing. Let's have a no deal. Let's have these Navy battleships on our borders. And actually, we'll increase our, our Navy. We'll increase our army. We'll actually start selling more arms and make more boats. <laughs> well, in fact, we, we already have just uh, massively increased military funding. In fact, Navy funding no less wasn't it 
Oh, well, that's interesting, isn't it? That that was that was uh, trumpeted just two weeks ago before all this nonsense started again. And, and that's, I think, if you remember in our last podcast, we said that was the first time we actually had anybody with any credibility or actually where Johnson was believing in what he was saying. And the actual defence minister actually came across. I saw him being interviewed. He came across. He knew what he was saying. He was cross-questioned and still had all the confident answers and said, well, you know, I'll give you 10 reasons why we should. In fact, we are behind yeah. second world countries I mean, at the how, moment. How long do we actually have left? Because there's a question I actually want to We haven't covered Trump yet, have we? And, and it's not on, it won't be on this podcast, but I want to be able to put it out there. And it's to do with, actually, with the amount of money the UK is having to pump into our economy right now to keep things afloat, what is going to actually happen to the foreign aid that we actually give to other countries? Because um, I think it was Nick Ferrari a couple of weeks ago on LBC talked about, I think, the 71 million that went to China. And why did it go to China when they're, in effect, even got an even stronger economy? So, um, so I'd like to know actually what is going to actually happen with foreign aid? What's actually no, going to happen with charity? No second peaks in China, are there? Well, the the the, 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 the fact uh, with foreign aid, which was blown again out of proportion by the media because they can't actually use a calculator or understand anything over seven words in a sentence with a full stop or a comma, is. The foreign aid, all Mr. Rishi, what's his name, Rishi Shunak has done, all he's done is change the percentage of foreign aid from 0.7% of GDP to 0.5% of GDP, which is still higher than most countries in Europe, which I think is, falls just behind Germany at the moment. But the point is, is not should we have foreign aid, is what are we spending it on? And no one was aware of that until Rishi Shunak for the first time said, I'm actually going to cut spending on something, because at the moment we're at £265 billion for this year when we normally spend and have a deficit of 80. So do you understand that we've got three times more the current debt than we normally, have, we normally would have in one year? Do you understand you know, the, the, the size of that? Because they're figures, because we've just discussed, we don't see the money moving around in suitcases. These are still numbers. You know, and even if we have 50 years to pay it off, does anybody really care? I don't think so. I mean, there, there was a rumor going around that um, because it is literally just digits on computers that the government were going to work around to some way of just cancelling it all, actually. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it, it is all imaginary, um, you know, where all that's happened is people are, you know, being put on furlough and the government are just send, uh, giving authority to various people on computers to send a few zeros and ones to other people's computers. Yeah, but you've got to add to that the cost of debt is so low that you're nearly paid to take out a loan because the Bank of England rate is at 0.1%. Look, I, I think is the stronger economies will actually, will actually bounce back from this, whereas a lot of the other countries won't. And as again, uh, you know, th this comes to the power shifting and how much power you actually have over other countries. So well, look at the stock market this. going up, and as we said, so being probably propped up by dirty money being laundered in. Yeah, no, but probably, probably no doubt. But the thing is, will the UK recover? I think yes. it will actually recover better than the EU. I think, I think we'll take a short-term hit. I think well, it'll we'll be the first well, to recover. Well, whatever, whatever short-term actually means, or how long short-term actually, you know, is determined. But I think the EU will actually struggle because the thing is, they've got so many other balls to keep up in the air. But this is the Pareto principle that we talked about time and again, isn't it? Uh, in, uh, in times of competitive uh, creativity, uh, the gap between the haves and have-nots continues yeah. to expand, which is why we'll end up in a crisis and eventual revolution. Okay, you want to come up with another fact? I'll give you another fact about, about, the, uh, about the current... I'm going to hit on the coronavirus very quickly in terms of... I'm talking about money now. The EU, late as usual, really worked out that maybe they should have a special fund in place to help governments, uh, countries out in these difficult times. So they proposed 500 billion euro fund yeah, to help other countries out, the one in need, and they have basic criteria, you know, what you need to follow in order to get the money. The EU, 27 states, because obviously since the end of January, the UK cannot vote, 27 states couldn't agree amongst themselves what the EU fund should be to help 
poorer, more difficult countries out. So in other words, France and Germany didn't want to pay 500 billion euros into the bank account because all the other countries, as we know, the criteria changed when we allowed the, let's say, poorer countries into the EU. They didn't have enough money. They didn't have enough reserves. And the bigger blocks like e the UK, which is one of the reasons why it's leaving, and France and Germany and Italy until they couldn't afford it anymore, were propping up about 20 countries. And now that tells you that the EU is falling to pieces because no one can pay for it anymore. You've allowed a lot of states to join the club when they didn't have the money to become a member in the first place. So either they're going to be propped up forever or some countries like the UK are saying, hang on a minute, I don't want to pay for this anymore. I've had enough. I need to get something back for my money. In business, it's called ROI, return on investment. And it is non-existent at the moment and has been for years. Well, I, I agree. I agree. In fact, talking about EU, I know it's, it's diverting slightly back to corona again, but what's, what's all this nonsense of air bridges or air restrictions? Because, because, let's face it, every single country is affected. So why on earth, why on earth are we restricting travel between countries? Can, can either of you answer that question? No. No? No, I can't. Just to destroy the, uh, the, the finances of all the, all the airline companies. I saw a tweet uh, yesterday, um, you know, when Mr. Grant snaps the transport secretary, whatever, sends out his useless little tweets of, I've done this and I've done that. And there's uh, some quite very direct tweets, let's put it politely. And one tweet turned around and said, I'm, I thought your job was to protect the travel and transport industry. Well, you failed at that, haven't you? And you're still employed. Anybody else would be sacked a long time ago. And he's watched it happen on his guard, on his watch. Well, actually, that, he's, he's made it happen. Look, I, I think, I mean, uh, how, long, how long do we have left? Four minutes. I don't know whether you need to ra start wrapping up or not, but there's one thing I probably, and it's probably not going to be covered on this podcast, but um, I've got to say, I mean, I've, I've got a few concerns about the future in terms of the influence of big tech that are actually happening um, on our thought patterns, on, on, you know, on, our, on the decision making, and is this a very subtle shift into an area before we don't realise it's going to happen before it's too late in terms of how we're controlled. Again, Big Pharma as well is another one. I mean, this whole COVID thing, I mean, who's actually really benefited from this? Um, big Pharma, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, big, big Pharma are going to get, you know, they're going to see a big boost. They've got their own deals with these medical experts who in turn have great deals with big media who feed us all this stuff, big tech. So all this is going on under the surface that we don't even realise. And one day we're going to be in a position that unless people start um, getting wiser, you, know, you may call it a conspiracy theory, but then again it's easy to throw out the whole conspiracy theory issue out there as just dumb until it actually happens. Well, I mean, it could be conspiracy or it could be opportunistic, let's face it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that Chris Whitty's profile has gone down recently. Have, have we actually seen him Who? recently? Chris Whitty. Have we seen him on TV recently? Well, I don't watch television anymore. Have you so seen him, Alexi? More Patrick Valance, isn't it? Although I did, I did put in a complaint to the General Medical Council about Chris Whitty a few weeks ago. So maybe that's it. Yeah, but, but, even, but even so, I mean, the thing is, they're, they're, it's, uh, you, you should almost see the subtle changes of how people have been constantly manipulated into thinking. You know, it, and it, it, it's cattle herding. They're herding you into a direction. And, and I think it's actually happened in the, in the U.S., I think their elections are, put it this way, people, or 50, nearly 40% well, of the people over there think that there's a, there was actually a problem with the election over there. Now, if you've got a lump over here, you would actually go and have it tested out to see if it was cancerous or not, wouldn't you? You would actually go and actually not dissect the lump, what's it called? Biopsy. You do a biopsy, that's right, you do a biopsy to actually check if there's something there or not. The thing is, everything that's happened in the States is, is got to make you wonder that if 40% of the people have, are questioning it, thousands of people have come out and done sworn affidavits as to whether there was a, um, as, to whether, uh, as to the irregularities, and the thing is, it goes to court and they actually throw it out. They're not even willing to go and do a biopsy of the situation to find out whether there is a problem or not, which makes you actually wonder 
what these politicians are actually doing because to 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 a layman you can see a plane in the face you've seen the video evidence you've seen so much and it's also happening in the UK it's just not as prolific at the moment it's, um, as to what's actually happened over there and I think what's going to happen in the, in the US particularly is there's going to be a lot of civil un- civil unrest going in the next four years. Now you'll put it forward to the, you'll blame it on the far right and the white supremacists, but it won't be that. It's people actually fighting against socialism. Um, and as soon and, and if Biden.